Thank you for, for coming and joining us today. Uh, and this is the panel uh, Executive Power in a Time of Dysfunction. So if you're on the plane to Chicago, now is a good time to get up and go to the panel you want to be at. Um, and uh, we have a really remarkably distinguished panel. And I want to uh, start by thanking ACS for making it possible and bringing these truly extraordinary people here. Um, and I want to caution you probably for the seventh time today to please turn off your cell phones if they're on or silence them or do something. Um, and I, I think I'm just going to, uh, you know, we, we'll just go ahead and, and leave a, a big chunk of time at the end for questions because I'm sure lots of people have lots of questions on this topic. But um, w when we were thinking about uh, this issue, we, we thought it's sort of an interesting problem because it how you feel about executive power, times of dysfunction or not, turns not just on how you feel about a particular president, but how you feel about a particular policy. So how you feel about ENDA, how you feel about military intervention, how you feel about curbing coal pollution uh, has to inform the way you think about this. And yet we're going to try really hard to transcend those, those questions. And the really granular questions, of course, we'll talk about them and try to find big unifying ideas uh, about executive power that can really go travel from one president to another and one issue to another. And, and certainly this is a very timely week again uh, to talk about uh, presidential power. Uh, Monday, the White House announced that Obama would sign an executive order prohibiting federal contractors from discrimina discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation and identity, uh, partly in recognition of the fact that I think ENDA is going to get stuck in the House. Tuesday, the White House announced plans to use executive power to turn a huge swath of the Pacific Ocean into a sanctuary for marine life. Uh, you know, this comes in the wake of weeks of announcements of executive actions to reduce coal pollution, alleviate student loan burdens, uh, and, you know, in the wake of a tw 2014 State of the Union promise to use executive authority to end run a, con a Congress that was being obstructive. So everything really is on the table from equal pay to gun violence uh, to clemency to uh, military intercession. And we're going to try as best we can to hit on the high notes and the low notes of all of that today. Um, but I think this panel really is going to make an effort to move behind and beyond who started it, who wears it better, uh, and I like it when my guy does it, but not so much when the other guy does it, and try to figure out some to the extent that we can find universal high-level principles for when the use of executive power, particularly in times of congressional obstruction, is useful. And we're cr going to try to think through what's been done using executive powers, what hasn't been done, what can been done, all with an eye toward, I think, how does the use of executive authority map onto progressive principles for democracy and governance. So I'm really delighted to introduce the panelists. You've got fuller bios in front of you, so I won't do complete bios. Uh, but immediately on my left, Stephen G. Bradbury, a law pr uh, partner at Deckert LLP. Uh, during the Bush administration, he was the head of the Office of Legal Counsel, where he served from 2004 to 2009. And while he was there, he advised the White House and the Attorney General on a full range of matters, ranging from uh, uh, anything and everything to do with presidential uh, and executive authority. To his left, I want to welcome Michael Gottlieb, a uh, partner at Boys and Schiller. Before joining the firm, he spent more than five years as special assistant to the president and associate White House counsel for Obama. So welcome. Uh, to my far right, Jillian Metzger is the vice dean and Stanley H. Fold professor of law uh, and faculty director for the Center of Constitutional Governance at Columbia Law School. Uh, she writes and teaches in the areas of admin and con law and specializes in federalism and privatization. Welcome. And finally, directly to my right, Ronald Weich is the dean of the University of Baltimore School of Law. Before that, he served as assistant attorney general for legislative affairs in the Justice Department, uh, representing the DOJ on all legislative matters before Congress. And I guess I should say I'm Dahlia Lithwick, and I write for Slate. <laughs> Um, so uh, we're going to first turn, and uh, we're going to try to leave about 30 minutes at the end, 25 to 30 minutes for questions, but that means we've got a, just an enormous amount of material to wade through now, and the panelists are um, going to promise to do that at lofty levels of abstraction and brilliance. So 
Uh, I'm going to turn uh, first to Stephen Bradbury uh, to sort of set the table for us. And, you know, this is an incredibly unfair thing we've tasked him with, but uh, we asked him to sort of, to the extent he can, come up with uh, some kind of list, bullet points, of, of grand unifying principles for when the president can and should be able to act unilaterally uh, at, with the wrinkle of is there a difference uh, with respect to foreign and domestic powers and the wrinkle, if he can get there, is there a difference when uh, he's dealing with an obstructive Congress? But I guess what we're asking for is to at least lay out the goalposts of uh, what are the rules for executive power. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Dahlia, thank you, and I want to thank ACS for the uh, invitation. It's a real pleasure to be here, and thanks everybody for the uh, interest, obvious interest in the in this uh, important topic. Um, I, I just want to uh, set the table, I guess, by sketching out uh, what I see as the constitutional framework that governs the exercise of presidential authority, and I'm really going to speak from the perspective of the executive branch. Uh, I think Ron's going to talk more from the perspective of Congress. There are three broad categories of authority relevant to this topic, I think, or one way to think about it, three broad categories of authority granted to the president by the Constitution. The first is, uh, flows from the duty that the president has faithfully to carry out statutes enacted by Congress, and that duty p implies an authority on the part of the president to interpret the law in the first instance, because the president has to have an understanding of what the law requires in order faithfully to carry out the law. Obviously, ultimately, the Supreme Court has the final say on what a statute means in cases of disputed issues that come before the court in cases and controversies. But in the first instance, and in many cases, these issues never get to the court. The president has to be able to interpret the law to, uh, to, to carry it out. The second broad principle or authority is the authority the president has as the chief executive officer of the United States for the federal government uh, to supervise the exercise of delegated authority by subordinates within the executive branch. And then the third authority I want to focus on is the authority to act as the principal representative of the U.S. in the conduct of foreign relations in the command of military operations and in the defense and advancement of the national security interests of the U.S. So in terms of the authority to interpret the law, uh, one kind of classic statement uh, of the principle is found in the Chevron case. Uh, in many ways, the most influential decision ever written by Justice Stevens, uh, a hugely important case that's applied all the time in administrative law, which essentially, one way to think about it is that it, it leaves discretion to the executive branch, uh, to an executive agency under the supervision of the president, uh, where statutory authorities are ambiguous, uh, where they leave, or where they leave policy making uh, decisions to the executive officers. Um, another, uh, an example also of the authority to interpret is at issue in the recess appointments cases because uh, the question there is what's, what's a recess of the Senate for purposes of the president's exercise of his authority, and really one way to look at the issue is whether the president shares some responsibility in interpreting what is a recess of the Senate, and that, that case is uh, before, the, b before the court right now. Obviously, there are uh, definite limits to the authority to interpret statutes. Uh, or constitution in the case of the recess appointments clause, but with statutes, uh, the president, uh, the executive agency may not ignore or override clear statutory requirements or apply statutory authorities in ways that uh, were clearly not intended by Congress. And I think there's an example of this issue before the Supreme Court right now in the greenhouse gas case that's still pending, uh, where the EPA applied the greenhouse, uh, applied the, um, permitting requirements of the Clean Air Act to uh, greenhouse gases and found that the application of the statute would have absurd results if applied as written and so took upon itself authority, some would say, to rewrite the statute and rewrite some clear statutory thresholds. And there's a real question of whether that is an exercise of interpretational authority that far exceeded the, the executive branch's uh, authority. Uh, there's also, I just want to point out, um, a traditional policy viewed as a traditional duty within the executive branch to enforce and defend federal statutes uh, 
against constitutional challenge wherever there is uh, any reasonable argument to support the constitutional the constitutionality of the statute. And we saw an important example of this, uh, really an exceptional decision by the executive branch not to apply that policy or that that a policy did not apply in the case of DOMA where the president and the attorney general made the decision there was no reasonable argument to support the constitutionality of DOMA and did not defend the statute. Highly, highly unusual uh, decision. The second authority I pointed out is the authority of the president to act as chief executive officer to supervise subordinates in the executive branch. And, and here the president has pretty broad latitude to issue executive orders that direct subordinate officers in how they're going to apply and carry out their authorities uh, under statutes. Uh, it, one way to think about this is as a practical matter, this authority is sort of coextensive with the president's power to remove the officer in question. So there are interesting questions about whether there's uh, limitations on the president's removal authority with an independent agency, for example. Um, but again, there are definite limits to the ability of the president to direct a subordinate, even one who serves at the pleasure of the president, in how that subordinate is going to carry out statutory authorities. So for example, the president, by executive order, may not authorize an officer to apply standards in carrying out a duty that are inconsistent with the stat standards required by the federal statute, um, or that ignore or supersede those standards uh, or requirements. Uh, the president cannot reassign authorities from one officer to another where those authorities are statutorily assigned. So we can't have some other agency carry out authority that Congress has assigned by statute to, to uh, a different agency. And the president can't create whole new programs or authorize the expenditure of funds that are not authorized by an appropriation of Congress or the incurrence of debt that's not authorized by, uh, by uh, act of Congress. So there are clear limits to the executive order authority of the president. The final one is the area of foreign affairs, military area, military operations, national security. And this area is where the president is recognized as having the paramount role for the United States. Um, and that necessarily means that there will be presidential authorities, particularly in that sphere. The similar arguments may apply where there's some express provision of the Constitution that gives the president, like the appointment power or something. But in, in, in the sphere of foreign affairs, national security, et cetera, um, this necessarily means that there are limits to what Congress can do in this area. Congress may not, by statute, usurp the exercise of the president's authority, may not so significantly if interfere with it in a given case under certain circumstances that the president is essentially disabled from carrying out what the president views as, as uh, the requirements of that authority. So some examples, you know, Congress is talking about amendments to the FISA statute in light of the NSA surveillance to try to prevent certain kinds of surveillance from ever happening again. Uh, that tees up the potential in the future again for another confrontation. If, for example, God forbid, there's another attack where the president perceives there's, a, there's an imminent threat to U.S. national security and believes that certain kinds of surveillance activities are, are really necessary to protect the U.S., that's to carry out the president's duty uh, to protect uh, national security, then uh, there may be a question of whether the application of that statute in a given case is going to be unconstitutional. War powers resolution or similar statutes that purport to put limits, uh, require the pullout of troops that are engaged in military activity, uh, for example, has long been seen as raising issues, and you know, we could get into it, uh, but the definition of what's hostilities under the War Powers Resolution and the, the controversy over that in, the, in connection with the um, Libya uh, air campaign where uh, the Justice Department initially advised the President, yes, these are hostilities, War Powers Resolution applies, that raised the question of whether it was unconstitutional. The president probably would have said it was unconstitutional to require him to pull out. Instead, the president overrode the Justice Department interpretation and said, no, I don't think these are hostilities. So the War Powers Resolution doesn't apply at all. And uh, so very interesting, interesting question of whether that exceeded the president's limits. And then, of course, the 30-day notice and wait provision that applies to the transfer of Gitmo detainees. It's been an issue here where the president had a signing statement saying, in certain circumstances, I will ignore that if I believe it interferes with my uh, 
uh, constitutional duties uh, for national security, et cetera. That's not exactly what he did in the case of the five Taliban detainees, and we can talk about that case, uh, which has been in the news a lot, uh, in more detail. I guess the last word I'll say, Dahlia, before turning it over to Ron, is that um, to answer your question that you teed up for everybody, I don't think these principles change or the application of these principles change if the president perceives that Congress is dysfunctional or not really carrying out its end of the bargain under the Constitution. I, I think, think these principles are sufficiently general that they can be applied whether or not the Congress is of the same party with the president and they're working together or, or, or not. Thanks. So, so that's a, a great opportunity to turn to Ron White and just say, uh, you wrote in a, a March op-ed this on, on filibuster reform um, that the Democrats who support it this spring were the ones who hated it uh, when Republicans supported it in 2005. And you had a nice line where you said, quote, in law school, we teach students to distinguish precedents. In Washington, inconvenient precedent is conveniently ignored. So I wonder if you can sort of talk about precedent, how we think about, how we used to think about executive power, how we think about it when it's different, but really through this lens of you come at it from the legislative angle. So um, respond to what Steve Bradbury said, but tell us the, the sort of legislative lens through which you see it. Sure, thank you, Dahlia. And I want to thank a ACS for inviting me to be here. Um, I kind of left the Washington scene two years ago to um, uh, be a dean or attempt to be a dean at. Uh, uh, the University of Baltimore, and, and, and so it's great to be back here for, uh, to discuss some of the things that I worked on um, in my years, both in the Justice Department and uh, in the Senate, and um, maybe I've had some opportunity over the two years to reflect on these things. Um, I did, you know, Dahlia's um, understandably abbreviated biography um, uh, sort of cut me off at the Justice Department, but I did work in the Senate before. Before that, I had a couple of different stints in the Senate and worked for Senator Harry Reid uh, as both minority leader and majority leader. I worked for Ted Kennedy, and I worked for Arlen Specter when he was a Republican. Um, so I really um, had an opportunity to be on all sides of the executive power question. I've been in the Senate majority and minority. I've worked in the Justice Department when we had uh, the, my president's power uh, party was in power in both the House and the Senate, and then later when uh, one House was controlled by the other party. Um, and uh, I actually had a chance to work in the uh, judicial branch agency a long time ago, and I think I have some perspective of how um, the judiciary thinks about these struggles. But I do think uh, that it is vital to maintain some consistency no matter where you sit. So uh, Steve correctly said that the principles don't vary uh, as you apply the principle, you know, as you apply them in particular cases. Um, and yet, um, it seems as though people forget. Everybody, it's amazing. Uh, <laughs> if you on some of these issues, um, uh, we might as well have had a ceremony on the steps of the Capitol. Uh, for a ceremonial exchange of talking points, right? You know, on <laughs> recess appointments, on uh, the nuclear option, on signing statements. Right. I mean, the very same people who uh, decried actions by President George W. Bush uh, applaud or uh, acquiesce, if you will, in, in the same actions by a Democratic president, and it's back and forth over the years. And, you know, we can all laugh about it and go have a drink, but I feel these are matters of principle and we should attempt, we should at least make a gesture towards uh, intellectual integrity here. So let's you know, try to see what the principles are no matter who, you know, Obama, Bush, Clinton, Millard Fillmore, let's sort of see what is presidential power. So where I would start, and Steve took us back to Chevron, I'll go back a little bit further to, to the uh, Youngstown case, uh, Justice Jackson writing in um, the Youngstown Sheet and Tube Company. Remember, uh, President Truman had seized uh, steel mills in the context of the Korean War, Justice Jackson writes for the, uh, well, he's actually concurs, it's a concurring opinion, um, and he t talks about presidential power. He, he, he actually, more broadly, he says, the actual art of governing under our Constitution does not and cannot conform to judicial definitions of the power of any of its branches based on isolated clauses, uh, far from context. While the Constitution diffuses power, the better to secure liberty, it also contemplates that practice will integrate the dispersed powers into a workable government. We'll get back to workable government. Um, and then as a presidential power, he, he posits that there are three broad categories. So first, he says, the president might be acting uh, with express or implied power from Congress. He says, that's when the president's power is at its maximum. Second, he says, there's sort of a twilight zone where uh, Congress has not acted. And he says, um, uh, congressional inertia, indifference, or quiescence. 
may sometimes, at least as a practical matter, enable, if not invite, measures on independent presidential responsibility. And then finally, he says that the president takes measures incompatible with the express or implied will of Congress. His power is at its lowest ebb. So I think that's a good way of thinking about all of this, no matter who is president. And um, what I glean from that are a set of, I don't know if they're principles really, they're just sort of thoughts that I'll, I'll run through here. Um, first of all, Congress matters. Um, and I say that having worked in, in both uh, Congress and the executive branch. And my experience in the executive branch really made me very respectful of um, the assertion of executive authority and the uh, enunciation of, of that authority by especially the Office of Legal Counsel, where Steve served. Um, I was not in OLC, I was in OLA, but my colleagues in OLC were very impressive, and the career people there have thought about this long and hard through administrations of different parties, and it was respectful. But through, while I acquired that perspective um, in three years in the Justice Department, I remain very uh, much of the view that Congress is Article I of the Constitution for a reason. It counts. It's the will of the people in a very direct way. Remember, the presidential um, elections are indirect. Um, and while the framers didn't think that the Senate was going to be chosen by direct election, by subsequent amendment, that's what we have there. And so Congress is so important, and presidents should respect it. Presidents should seek congressional authority when there's doubt. Um, and Congress, uh, the president should be reluctant to act in the face of congressional inertia, or especially in the face of congressional objections. Um, it's not just that Congress you know, represents the, the will of the people, and, and any president should be respectful of that. Um, another point is that bipartisanship, I mean, which you, you can only get from the president working with um, Congress in most instances, um, is, is it makes something stronger. You know, President Obama was criticized so much um, for, well, I guess the, the Affordable Care Act has been greatly criticized. Um, uh, become so controversial, so toxic in, in political discussions. And of course, one reason for that is that it was passed essentially with uh, only um, uh, Democratic votes. President Obama strained. He was criticized by some for trying so hard to get Republican support. Remember, he let the discussions with Senator Baucus uh, and, and Senator Grassley go on. He sat with Senator Enzi and Senator Collins and Senator Specter trying to, to make the thing bipartisan. He knew that that bipartisanship would strengthen the law in its implementation in the years ahead. So. Congress is so important, and you know the president, uh, I think, has become frustrated, as presidents tend to do, with congressional inaction. But you can't lose sight of Congress's role in all of this. Um, having said that Congress is important, we recognize that there are some instances where the president can act alone. And Steve, I think, did a nice job of describing uh, what some of those circumstances are. I'll be a little bit normative and say that I think that the president should feel most comfortable acting alone. Um, or, and even sometimes in the face of congressional disagreement on matters of national security. Um, you know, the provision that Steve referred to in the defense authorization bill that says that the, pres that the Congress gets 30 days notice before the president would transfer a, a, a Guantanamo detainee, I, I just hate that provision. I think the president should have vetoed it. It's outrageous um, uh, because it's congressional micromanagement. And I haven't heard anybody ask the question, what exactly will Congress do with this information during the 30 days they have it, except to leak it if it's secret? Um, are they going to pass a law that says you may not transfer, you know, Guantanamo detainee X? Um, it's, it's, it's really kind of a, a strange provision, um, and therefore I think the president has authority to, to deal with Guantanamo detainees as he sees fit, um, and the fact that he um, issued a signing statement saying that he felt free to uh, not comply with that provision, I think, was justified. And again, you know, that was something that uh, Democrats, uh, for whom I work, criticized President Bush for, for issuing signing statements that claimed authority like that, but I think it's justified. I think, um, again, uh, my normative view is that um, the president is uh, most justified in acting uh, on his or her own when um, it's a matter of implementing the law, um, carrying out a law, like, for example, the Clean Air Act. People look at the EPA regulations and say, oh, it's you know, unilateral presidential action. Sure, he's interpreting a law that Congress passed many years ago. Congress could amend that law to prevent the regulation, but they haven't. Um, so I say the president should go ahead and do that. Um, uh, and then, um, you know, where the president is acting as to individual cases, so the Guantanamo detainees or um, um, you know, the criminal justice area, clemency is an obvious area where the Constitution gives the president very uh, 
uh, explicit unilateral authority to, 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 to pardon prisoners um, is, is authorized there. Um, the president should always be cognizant of the checks. So two checks. First of all, uh, congressional checks. Um, <laughs> you know, don't you know? You say, don't fool with Mother Nature. You know, if you if you fool with uh, with Congress, they'll come and get you. Um, and their Congress has lots of tools: the power of the purse, the oversight authority to to make a president and an executive branch officials life miserable uh, with with uh, uh, lots of uh, letters and, and uh, subpoenas and so forth. Um, and ultimately cutting off funds for certain activities. So the president can try to go it alone, but will often be pushed back by Congress, and that's a natural give and take. Um, and then the judiciary. You know, a lot of the actions that President Obama has taken have been and can be subject to challenge in court. So Noel Canning, uh, the canning company, right, took the case to court, and we'll find out within a matter of days, I guess, um, whether the president had the authority to, uh, to make those recess appointments or the EPA regulations will be challenged, um, and, and, and so forth. Um, mandates on contractors. Those contractors may well challenge those mandates. Uh, finally, it seems to me restraint is a virtue. Just because the president has authority doesn't mean he or she should use it. Um, I very much admire President Obama for not, uh, uh, for example, saying that he had authority to raise the debt uh, level. Um, there were all sorts of political and practical reasons why it would have been nice to do that and, and change that bargaining equation, but uh, OLC advised that he didn't have the authority, and so he didn't. And I think presidents in general should be applauded for exercising restraint. And then finally, very last thought, going on too long, um, I want to say that I'm very much uh, disturbed by the title of this panel. I'm serious. Executive power in a time of political dysfunction. So that, to me, is chilling, because it seems to suggest that the executive power is different, that somehow the president has authority in a time of political dysfunction. And let's be frank, when the ACS, an organization I love very much, says that, what they mean is the Republicans won't give the president what he wants, so shouldn't he go out and get it himself? Um, I tell you, having been in this kind of battle over the years, uh, lots of presidents would claim times of political dysfunction. President Bush would have claimed it in 2005 when I worked for Harry Reid and we were stopping him from doing some of the things he wanted. He wanted to privatize Social Security. We said no. Um, Newt Gingrich would have called it political dysfunction when he was passing the contract with America in the House and Senator Kennedy and others were stopping him uh, in those years. Harry Truman, Fra Franklin Roosevelt, and probably Miller Fillmore, I don't know, would have uh, talked about political dysfunction. And it is a very scary, almost nihilistic kind of thing to say, well, now that things aren't quite working, we've got to take matters into our own hands. Um, I respectfully submit that way lies uh, danger. Uh, I, I think they're going to take your tote bag away for that. Oh, no. um, <laughs> Jillian Metzger, um, it, you, you have a, an enormous amount to respond to, um, but bring to this the valence of, as an academic, uh, are there neutral principles? Are these the neutral principles? Uh, and maybe toggling back and forth between very context-specific, very nuanced controversies, can you actually have uh, 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 general principles? And, and maybe because we've heard about the executive and the legislative branch, if, to the extent that you can talk about what happens uh, with respect to the courts, uh, and, and all of that in six minutes would be awesome. All right, then. All right. so <laughs> thanks. I'm also delighted to be here. Um, and I, I think I've, I had four points that I wanted to make, and I think actually they fit very nicely with responding um, to uh, what, what uh, Steve and Ron have said. Um, and there's a fair amount of uh, overlap. Um, so to give it the, the academic uh, angle at the outset, um, the first point I want to make is that there is nothing new about assertions of executive powers being needed in the face of political dysfunction. Um, uh, if you go back uh, to the sort of advent of the modern presidency in the progressive period, it was in response to claims of congressional failure. Um, and it has continued as, of course, the dominant strain um, in the shape of government over the 20th century was a massive expansion in executive power, and often that has been against claims of, of the need of the executive to act, greater complexity, greater pro problems, the birth of the New Deal state. So this is, this is really nothing new. Um, uh, and um, I think one of the things to also bear in mind that as the presidency has expanded, there has been that much more pressure on the president to advance a policy agenda. Um, 
And so not surprisingly, you do see presidents turning to the levers of administration and executive action in order um, to meet the, the political expectations on them. Uh, true very much from Democratic and Republican, and I would strongly echo Ron's uh, point. There isn't often a lot of consistency um, in how these issues are approached, and it's worth bearing in mind um, the extent to which what's good for the goose is gonna be good for the game. Um, I think that's a mixed metaphor, but you guys know what I mean. <laughs> um, uh, the second point I wanna make, and uh, it also relates to the title of the, of the, of the panel. Um, uh, it, it's more though that I think it's a little bit deceptive. Um, when you talk about political dysfunction, it sounds, uh, particularly in this context, like Congress is doing nothing and the president is acting unilaterally. Um, and there certainly is important ways in which presidents do act uh, unilaterally, right? Um, and this goes to the whole structure of the president compared to Congress. Congress is beset with collective action problems or any number of veto gates that, or, or points where it's hard for Congress to act. The idea of the president is energy, um, unified, uh, as ways of trying to overcome those. Now actually I think the executive branch um, uh, is a more complex beast than that image suggests, but it's true that even at its best time of functioning, Congress often has a very hard time overturning presidential and executive branch action, um, and that those impediments are intensified by political dysfunction. Um, and that means that often presidential initiatives stick. Even if there's a change in presidential administration, they become entrenched, either politically or legally. Um, so uh, presidents do have a lot of power, it's true, um, to push their policies um, in a sense that you might think of unilaterally. That said, um, one point uh, that Ron made is Congress also has a lot of tools. Um, it may not be enacting substantive legislation, but it's holding a whole lot of oversight and hearings and funding controls and marshalling interest groups um, and has a lot of pressures that it can bring to bear uh, in the political arena. Um, more importantly, there is a vast amount of legislation out there. It is not the case that the president is acting um, unilaterally in the sense not against a, a very dense statutory background. Um, uh, and this relates to Steve's point about statutory interpretation, um, Ron's point about implementation, right? That is the reality. There is a lot of statutory uh, background and the question is um, the president's role in implementing. That relates to my third point, which is that we confuse or we conflate, I think, a lot of different questions when we talk about presidential power. And there are a few that I think need to be pulled apart. Two in particular is the distinction between is there any power in the executive branch to undertake a certain action at all, and the question of where in the executive branch does that power primarily lie. Um, and we've heard this come up uh, in uh, both Steve and Ron's remarks. Uh, Steve, you talked about the, the president uh, as supervisor, chief executive officer, right? Um, Ron, you as well talked about the president um, as able to issue directives. Um, I think there are a lot of complex questions about executive power when it gets to the question of the relationship of the White House, the relationship of OMB, and implementation of statutes and the agency and, and who actually has the, the power to undertake certain actions. Um, and we tend to, when we think of president power writ large or executive power writ large, we don't <coughs> focus on the very important details there that are the intra-executive branch details. If you think about this in terms of EPA, if you go back and look at President Obama's uh, directive on greenhouse gases, it is a very carefully framed document precisely to acknowledge that the statutes grant certain authority to EPA to note that EPA had already indicated it was gonna take certain actions and to, to encourage them to pose deadlines in a very supervisory way, but to back off some of the substantive stuff that you might otherwise think. So that's a very important dynamic here. Um, another key question, I think, is whether or not you're gonna access executive power formalistically or realistically. Um, realistically, the president's institutional advantages as a first mover, um, as one who can change the status quo, doesn't have the collective action problems of Congress, means that there is gonna be a whole lot of presidential uh, and executive branch action and there's gonna be more in a period of political dysfunction, right? Um, I think intuitively, and I think you've heard this on the panel, people are less comfortable thinking that that should formally affect our assessment of, of presidential power. And I have to say here, I understand the argument that I agree on the level of principle, you don't want constitutional principle to change with the political party in office. Um, I would not conflate the question of institutional reality, however, with uh, political party political administration. Um, I think that actually as a matter of case law, um, the uh, institutional reality does factor in um, to assessments of the scope of, of presidential power. Um, and I, you know, if, if the reality is that our government is functioning in certain ways and operates in certain ways, 
Um, I'm actually somewhat troubled by doctrine that doesn't ever take that into account and that doesn't map on the reality of government and how it works. Um, uh, and so let me now turn then more to how that might matter, in particular, Dahlia, with your reference to um, how the courts assess things, right? So uh, as Ron mentioned, um, steel seizure is the jumping off point. That's the dam dominant uh, legal paradigm, the tripartite framework where uh, Justice Jackson very carefully titrates executive power in respect to congressional power, and this relates to, in part, Steve's first category, right? The duty to take care sets up an automatic relationship between the scope of presidential authority and what Congress does. Um, that said, I think in practice, the Jackson framework uh, does less work than is often acknowledged. Um, because what really matters is which zone do you put the presidential action in? Um, and then what's really driving the analysis is, what are the presumptions we're bearing in, uh, in assessing a statute to determine whether or not this is actually a case of zone one, Congress has authorized, um, or this is a case of zone three, Congress has prohibited, and then the zone that the courts never get to, because they avoid at all costs, the zone two. Um, uh, it is true, there are some instances where it's very hard to say Congress has not prohibited something. There's a case before the court um, for next term, Zivotofsky, the case dealing with uh, the recognition power. Um, that is such a case. Um, uh, some would say the 30-day warning is another one of those cases. In general, I think they're pretty rare. And I think often there's a lot of room and ambiguity to think about Congress as having possibly provided a, a basis for uh, presidential action. So when I think about the topic for this panel, I think that one way of understanding it is how should political dysfunction play in in terms of our presumption of how we will read the background statutes um, that affect whether or not presidents have power? Should we think of political dysfunction as a reason to read those as more likely putting it into zone one so that the government can act and be effective? Should we read them as actually being more reason to see zone three because Congress isn't gonna be able to check whatever the president does and although you can get many of these into court, not always. Um, uh, and you can, I don't think you can really assess that and what should be the right presumption outside of context. And my, the last point I wanna make is to return to the intra-executive branch point that I made. I think one of the most important factors is what is the, the structure, what is the framework within the executive branch by which decisions are being made. When you're assessing a presumption of political dysfunction, that seems to orient us very much in Congress versus the president or the executive branch, but the president right now. Um, and I think what really plays much more of a role is what's going on inside the executive branch. How many different voices agencies are coming into play to what extent is this the president supervising versus the president directing versus the president stopping an agency for acting? Um, uh, and those really matter. Um, and I think there's much more ability to uh, be comfortable with the idea of political dysfunction maybe leading to a broader assessment of, of executive branch power if you think that within the executive branch framework there are other checks and balances that provide room for public accountability, that provide transparency, that provide form that, that do a lot to deal with our fears of unconstrained executive power. Uh, so that brings us to Michael Gottlieb. And I think that you are gonna talk about this more specifically sort of thinking through war power, is that right? That you wanna talk about AUMF? And, or, or do you just wanna, you can also just respond to the uh, yeah. enormous amount of uh, stuff that's yeah, been I'll said. I'll just cover everything that everyone okay. said. Okay, there you go. First, I, I also want to just say thank you to ACS for having me here. I was um, a second year law student at Harvard when the first ACS chapter uh, was formed on campus there and a group of, 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 our, of my friends and I um, at the prodding of Heather Gerken, who was then a, a professor at Harvard, helped start this uh, first chapter there and I don't think uh, anyone ever had and he, I mean, it was the first chapter at Harvard, not the first chapter anywhere, anywhere. but I don't think anyone ever had uh, any concept that it would become such a thriving organization, and it's just really wonderful to see how the organization has grown, so um, cheers to the organization and to all of you here today participating in this uh, conference. I also just wanted to say my uh, biography was slightly inaccurate also. I didn't spend five years in the White House. That would really call into question my sanity. Um, <laughs> I, I actually started my first job uh, during law school. I started as an uh, intern on the Senate Judiciary Committee, and then after I finished clerking, I went back uh, for a little while on the Senate Judiciary Committee. So I spent some time learning to love Congress before I was then instructed on how to hate it. Um, <laughs> and I went to the executive branch. 
So I, I too have been on both sides of the aisle. Um, I, I think there's there are a couple of examples uh, that have been touched on here that um, that really demonstrate the interplay between the president and Congress uh, with respect to executive power. And and I too thought that the title of the panel was interesting. Uh, what is it? What is a time of political dysfunction? So I so I looked it up. Um, and the, I wanted to see, I, I assumed that what this meant was that Congress is dysfunctional, and so therefore, what do we think about executive power uh, with a dysfunctional Congress? So I, I looked it up, and I discovered that um, the 112th Congress uh, enacted 231 bills in its, during its session. Um, and I wonder if anyone in the audience knows how many bills the Do Nothing Congress of 1948 that Harry Truman campaigned against enacted in its in its time. Nine hundred. So, I I think that one of the factors that leads people to think that Congress is dysfunctional is that there's not many pieces of legislation being passed, and so people are tallying that up. But that can be slightly misleading, and it, and it leads to a very interesting point that will circle us back to this 30-day notice provision and signing statements. And it's slightly misleading because the rise of omnibus appropriation legislation <laughs> and massive, massive bills that Congress passes where you know, hundreds if not thousands of items, many of which are non-germane to the title of the bill, get jammed into one piece of legislation. And so this practice you know, started around the time of the New Deal and became increasingly common. The first presidential signing statement happened during the Monroe administration, but it really didn't become common until uh, much later. The Reagan administration uh, had, a, had a large number of signing statements. The Bush one administration had a large number. The Clinton administration had a huge number. The Bush two administration had a, a very large number if you count it with respect to specific sections of statutes. Um, but one of the reasons for the rise of signing statements in this presidential practice is because presidents have been faced with the choice looking at a large piece of a, an omnibus appropriation bill which will contain funding, for example, for housing programs or for military pay or for any number of programs that are really important for the president's priorities and for Congress's priorities, the president is faced with the choice if he objects to one hypothetical application of one section out of 1,500, do I veto this bill based on that hypothetical application or do I issue a signing statement letting Congress know if this situation arises, I plan to interpret this bill to avoid a constitutional difficulty or confrontation. The Bush administration used many signing statements along those lines, and, uh, and the administration was criticized for it by many progressives and by many people who wound up in the Obama administration. The, uh, the then-Senator Obama campaigned on the promise of uh, severely restricting signing statements. In fact, uh, at a couple of campaign appearances, he uh, made some statements that some people have interpreted as, as, as meaning that he would never use signing statements. I don't think that was an accurate interpretation, <laughs> neither that or he misspoke, but that's neither here nor there. Um, so how does this connect back to this Bo Bergdahl issue? Um, the, the, re the way it connects back is that the, the President and Congress have been uh, at odds with each other for getting back five years now on detention policy, and this is an area where um, with respect to the disposition of individual detainees, the president is, I think almost anyone would agree, acting as the commander in chief of the armed forces. Um, the decision whether to detain someone in an international armed conflict, the decision whether to release someone in an international armed conflict is a quintessential command decision. On the battlefield, commanders make those decisions. At the level of Gitmo, the president acting as commander in chief is making decisions uh, either delegated or directly about whether to uh, detain or release individuals. So Congress passes restrictions in the National Defense Authorization Act that says before you can release uh, anyone uh, from Guantanamo, you need to give us a set period of notice and you need to provide a certain set of certifications. And that's con that is provision is contained in the National Defense Authorization Act that also has pay for troops. It has funding for certain military weapon systems. It has and not, you know, hundreds uh, of provisions that are vitally important to the administration. So for uh, dating back four years, the president, before those bills were signed, issued statements of administration policy to Congress saying, please, 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 please change this. This is bad policy, as Ron was uh, suggesting. This is bad policy. This doesn't make any sense. This is bad for the military. It's bad for foreign policy. We really want you to change it. And by the way, if you don't change it, we might veto this bill. 
Congress calls the president's bluff and says, we don't really think you're going to veto this bill. This has got pay for the troops in it. It's got all this important stuff. It's got so many sections. There's no way you're going to veto this bill just based on the section. Congress is right. The president doesn't veto the bill. The president signs it, but he has a signing statement that says there are certain applications of this notification provision that would call into question uh, my authority as commander in chief. And in the event that it does, I'm going to interpret the bill in a way that uh, avoids those constitutional conflicts. That, that language goes back, I think, four years in different signing statements to the 2010 National Defense Authorization Act signing statement. Um, so here you have that hypothetical conflict that may, that may have never arisen, in which case the president will look pretty smart for signing the bill and putting the signing statement in, but it arose in this circumstance. And the president was faced with the choice of uh, abiding by the congressional notice requirement or uh, uh, following the, the, the signing statement language. And in this case, he followed the signing statement language. So I do think this is a, a we could have a long conversation about uh, whether the president's Article II authorities entitled him uh, to ignore the statute or another long conversation about whether the language of the statute was sufficiently ambiguous that the president could kind of get around it because they didn't mean to restrict this kind of a transfer. But at the end of the day, that this interplay between an evolving practice in Congress to create larger and larger pieces of legislation and the response from the executive branch to, to use signing statements as sort of a tactical way of, of dealing with that. Uh, and, and this is, I think this Bergdahl transfer is a perfect illustration of how that practice evolves over time and how it plays out uh, in, in practical consequences. And um, I'm sure we have a lot more issues to cover, so I'll just stop there. Uh, uh, it looks as though, uh, Steve Bradbury, you, you are holding your constitution, which suggests <laughs> that you might want to respond. And in any event, I feel that you need the opportunity to, to trash the title of the panel. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, but if you, I, I, you want to uh, uh, respond to Michael before we take questions, um, uh, I would love to hear what you have to say. OK. Um, <laughs> You sounded remarkably like Jay Bybee for a, for a few minutes there. Uh, the, 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 the notion that um, the president's commander in chief authority means he has plenary authority over the handling of detainees uh, is controversial. I mean, there is a provision in the Constitution that gives Congress authority to make rules concerning captures on land and water. And there was a view that, well, that that's only captures of property. Um, but at the end of the Bush administration, I actually wrote a memo that called into question that interpretation and suggested, no, there's historical precedent to believe that does give Congress some recognized authority to set the rules for the handling of prisoners of war, detainees captured um, in military, uh, military actions. Um, but, uh, I think the president was uh, uh, on solid ground in suggesting, at least in theory, that there may be circumstances in which the requirement to comply with a restriction like that could interfere with the president's exercise of authority he deems critical to protect the national security interests or for foreign relations uh, purposes. But I do think it's important to re realize that well, it's a fairly benign requirement. I understand Ron doesn't see any uh, purpose in the requirement that could fulfill a valid authority of Congress, uh, but it is merely a notice and wait provision. And there's a ton of notice and wait provisions in legislation that give uh, heartburn to the executive branch, but typically the executive branch honors the notice and wait requirement. So I think there would have to really be a situation where the president was on solid ground and had a reasonable basis to determine that waiting 30 days would interfere with the president's authority as commander in chief or to protect the country or for foreign relations. And that might have been, I think, an argument if it, what he was really talking about was a, uh, an agreement with the Taliban to participate in the uh, peace peace process, whatever, the, the original sort of notion of what was being worked out. But at the end of the day, it seems like the only ground given was the health of Bo Bergdahl himself is the reason. Um, and it doesn't sound like the, 
the decision was based on a conclusion that the application of the statute was unconstitutional, but rather, I think as you alluded to, Michael, an interpretation of the statute that said, well, Congress couldn't have intended it to apply where the life of a, of a, a member of the U.S. Armed Forces was arguably uh, at, at issue. And uh, that's a difficult interpretation of the language. It didn't have an exception in it. Um, so um, I think it was a stretch. I really think it was a stretch. I understand the very practical concern of the, the difficulty of Congress keeping a secret. Um, uh, but I don't think that changes the interpretation of the statute or the nature of the president's, uh, president's authority. Um, I'm not going to jump on the bandwagon of trashing the, the, uh, <laughs> All right. the uh, uh, although I did uh, express the view, I don't think, I, I really don't think the legal analysis changes based on the, the nature of the showdown uh, traffic jam between the executive branch and the, and the legislative branch. Okay, so uh, an extra tote bag for um, Stephen Bradbury <laughs> and right. give, give Ron's away. Um, we have about 25 minutes for questions. I am going to beg you to ask them in a form of a question uh, because we have, uh, this is, you know, there are a lot of people and, and good questions. Please wait for a microphone and uh, why don't we start, you want to start right there? Okay. So just uh, quickly on still on the Boebert Bell uh, situation, I'm wondering if Who's the question for? Do you? Um, well, I, I don't think it changes the interpretation of the statute, but it, I mean, it may play into a valid decision the president makes that, uh, for example, the disclosure needs to be very limited to, to who in Congress gets the disclosure, the, the form of the disclosure, um, and there needs to be a dialogue with Congress and uh, I just uh, you know the unfortunate thing here which I think is a large explanation for the unhappiness on the uh, Capitol Hill side by both Republicans and Democrats and is is that there evidently was no discussion or consultation at least not in the recent period leading up to this decision I guess there had been a, a year or two ago when they were talking about a bigger deal a grand deal but I just uh, just to circle back. I did not mean to suggest that I think that the president has plenary authority over all uh, detention decisions. Congress certainly has a legitimate role to play. Um, I think that the point that you raise about the possibility of information leaking and the deal then breaking down and then uh, Bergdahl's uh, 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 life therefore being in jeopardy was a part of the argument that the administration made to defend. Um, essentially ignoring the requirement that they notify Congress. They they have they have in public. Um, made two arguments in the alternative. They have said, um, they have at least hinted through sources on background that the provision would be unconstitutional if applied in this matter. And they, they have also said that they, that they think that the, uh, the statute was, as, in, as it was written, was not intended to cover a situation like this. It was intended to cover your typical transfer situation to a third country. Um, I think that that argument is really tough for them based on the wording of the statute and based on the fact that during the time that the NDAA was passed, the last time around, this deal had been written about it, had been talked about it, had been discussed, it was on people's mind. It's a, it's a really tough argument to, uh, to say that the, the language of the statute, which contains no exception uh, in it, and is pretty clear just based on the text, uh, has that sort of inherent exception in it. So I, I think that they, if, if you're just sort of analyzing the legal arguments on the merits, it, it has to fall back on some kind of a constitutional argument about the, the president's ability to release uh, Bergdahl in a diplomatic exchange with the Taliban that's aimed at starting up peace negotiations. It sort of implicates a lot of the president's traditional Article II authorities. And even though Congress clearly does have constitutional responsibility to regulate the armed forces and to make rules concerning capture, um, perhaps uh, the president's authority sort of prevails uh, or trumps in that situation. Do, do either of you want to respond on Bergdahl? 
I, I was going to quickly say, for me, it's not a matter of interpretation, statutory interpretation. I just think the provision is unconstitutional. But I was going to take a, a step back and just say part of the problem here, I think, is that um, we don't have a consensus in this, so many areas, it seems, uh, a, a basic, you know, we're not, we're not rowing in the same direction. So President Obama wants to close Guantanamo. Uh, many in Congress, especially Republicans, uh, want to keep it open and therefore don't want people transferred. So uh, this Bergdahl situation arises after years of, you know, the early years of the administration where the president was trying to transfer people to third countries and was being thwarted by um, different congressional maneuvers, including this provision. Um, the, you know, the, the concept of a, of a wait and see uh, provision is often to give Congress the chance to pass legislation to block it. It's true for regulations or I mean, a somewhat different context um, you know, when sentencing guidelines are promulgated by the Sentencing Commission, it's, uh, I think, six months before they take effect because Congress, in theory, could pass a law to block the changes. Um, here, you know, I really think the provision was instituted, and of course it's in a form that was less um, draconian than therefore Democrats in the, in the Congress went along with it. Um, but, you know, it's, it's really intended to stop the president from doing something uh, that, that there had been consensus on because Senator McCain running for president thought we should close Guantanamo. But on this, in so many areas where you know, the branches, the parties are not um, suggesting different means to the same end, they're suggesting opposite ends. And just one point to add to that, this is clearly not a case of dysfunction. This is a case of the president and Congress disagreeing right. about what the policy should be and the, 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 the jam that the administration finds itself in is a product of this being a provision in an omnibus piece of legislation. If this had come up on its own, the president certainly would have vetoed it. Okay, uh, uh, who's got a mic? Uh, okay, right there at the back, yeah. Hi, I'm, I'm Bill Marshall. I'm on the board of ACS Program Committee, which I normally wouldn't mention, except I was helping responsible for the title. <laughs> 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 and, and actually, Rod, some of us agree with your point of view. Okay. You can keep your toes <laughs> <laughs> You're suggesting that if there's more transparency within the executive and maybe unilateral executive power may be less troublesome than in other within other circumstances, if I if I caught you right. But if, if following up from from then Professor Kagan's article, uh, if the presidency is able to exercise more political control over its agencies, then certainly we've seen it be able to exercise more control over the Department of Justice. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I think that's why we should be focusing on what those structures are, just as an overall point. Um, I think there's actually been much more attention to that about the, the actual relationships. Um, I do think actually in a number of contexts, there are still important intra-executive intra branch structures to think of. And um, so, you know, wearing my ad law hat and thinking a little bit about some of the EPA stuff, right? So there's a whole process within EPA that's statutorily mandated about how you go about assessing evidence, you have the clean air. Uh, scientific advisory committee. You have a lot of different procedures within an agency assessing ex uh, evidence, bringing in expertise, as well as obvious political decisions, right, and political agenda. It's a much more, it's a very complicated process. There's many avenues for checks. It's transparent, it's notice and comment rulemaking. That kind of framework, um, uh, I think, plays into the questions about uh, how we might assess action that comes out. It's very interesting. If you look at some of the accounts, um, there was a story on Politico about Obama walking around the, the White House uh, uh, lawn and debating how to structure it and stuff. And if you're looking at that from an ad law perspective, thinking, "How oh, well, where is the EPA administrator in that particular uh, uh, discussion? And then you look at the, what he did say, and you do see this effort to engage with EPA and in EPA's expertise. So I think that matters. Um, this again, matters on context. That's EPA, it's against a regulatory statute that grants the authority to regulate to an agency, not an independent agency, so drawing on Kagan's, that's another difference, right? Not national security, not foreign relations, where you also have the claims of inherent political, uh, inherent constitutional power. Um, so I, I mean, if the question is, does it matter that you've got OLC uh, uh, issuing an interpretation? I think it does, actually. Um, I think that that plays a role and. It is easy to exaggerate um, uh, how much the, the political control can dominate. I think some accounts have been 
uh, too willing to say that it's just become politicized. I think there actually is important constraints that come through that process, often that we may not know about. Um, uh, but when you're thinking about presidential action, particularly against the broad statutes that exist, you also have to include very much the regulatory context, and then you're talking about agencies and the agency White House dynamic. Okay. Um, but, uh, right back here. Yep. Yep. Scott, and uh, I'm also on the board, and I'm here also to defend the title. <laughs> uh, and that is, uh, I'm going to raise another area of political dysfunction, which is the immigration system. And there's all this debate now about the fact that there, despite the fact that everybody accepts that this is not working, that so many people, I mean, these reports in the New York Times of you know children on the border and these and these terrible encampments. Um, the question is, if Congress isn't going to act, what, there's a debate now about what can the president do with respect to non-enforcement or administrative action. And I, I'm not sure which of you um, on the panel would have a viewpoint on that, but it would be great if we could hear something on that question of the ability of the president to act in light of the fact that we're not seeing comprehensive immigration reform. Well, I'll, I'll just very briefly say I think the – the president with his, what's it called, uh, deferred action for childhood arrivals uh, policy. I, I think what that executive action is based on is a concept of prosecutorial discretion. Well, maybe, you correct, maybe I'm wrong, but I think, you know, uh, when Congress says, for example, all people in this category, this is a violation of law and, and they're eligible to be removed from the United States, for example. Um, that implies that the executive branch in carrying that out is acting kind of like a prosecutor enforcing the law or bringing cases to enforce the law and, and necessarily it's recognized there are limitations to resources. Prioritizing has to be done the prosecutor needs to make decisions about which case to bring first, which cases to focus on and give priority to, and there's this broad concept of prosecutorial discretion. You can't really second guess the prosecutor for deciding to you know, give you a, a, traffic, a speeding ticket and not the other guy who passed you on the road. You know? um, and I think what the president has done in this case with this policy is seize that concept of prosecutorial discretion and kind of run with, run with it and, and say, in the exercise of prosecutorial discretion, here are the standards we're going to apply. We're going to focus on this category first and not these other categories. We're going to move them to the back of the queue and effectively uh, excuse their uh, violation of the law or their you know, not, not having the right to be in the, in the United States, whatever. Um, and this is a, I mean, I think it's taking the concept, it's really stretching the limits of the concept. And I think that's the, that's the controversy there. But you're right that there is a uh, argument that Congress hasn't stepped up and provided the level of funding, personnel, et cetera, to really enforce the law to the full extent uh, that some in Congress might, might like. But I think that's the concept. Did you? Uh, yeah, I mean, because uh, just to, uh, give a little bit on the, on the other side. Since I agree entirely with prosecutorial discretion, and often prosecutorial discretion is non-transparent. It's very low level. That's right. You have complete lack of political accountability. Um, one of the things to say for what uh, President Obama did is that by elevating it, by setting out the categories, um, it is a much more transparent, much more politically accountable exercise of power that can then be debated and engaged with. And you can have those who will take the, the political accountability then directing um, lower level officials who would other, actions would otherwise be hidden. And I think there's something, again, going back to my intra-executive branch yeah. uh, structures, to me that actually uh, matters. Once you've got discretion, then the question is really where should it be, where should it be exercised? Um, and I think there is something to be said for this. And it's interesting because th there's a tension here, right? Because is it taking care if it's at odds with the statute, right? But if taking care also means supervising, mm -hmm. This is, in a sense, supervising exercise of discretion that's in the system. So I think it's a complicated assessment. I think you were getting at this when you said it may push the limits, but it's, I can see some arguments for saying um, that's actually an appropriate exercise of discretion within the, the system at the level that you might want it to be exercised. Can I, may I just say, I, I understand that and appreciate that. I think it's kind of uh, is an example of the potential downsides of uh, 
transparency, which is such a, such a wonderful concept these days. It's, every, it's always held up as a positive. Um, and, and, and that is when you actually state the standards by which the discretion is going to be exercised and publish them like this, in effect, you are changing the law. You are saying w the law is, doesn't apply in these broad categories as a general matter. It's not a, really a matter of case-by-case -case discretion. I am exercising this discretion in a way that effectively changes the law so that it's not what Congress uh, intended. The other downside is you publish the standards for the exercise of discretion, and then people in the real world begin adjusting their conduct in response to what you've, you've said, and so you see the flood of uh, people at the border trying to take advantage of the policy. Okay, in the back, yep. So, sure. First, full disclosure, Burke was my first boss in Washington in 1982 when I was an intern in Senator Kennedy's office, and he was reauthorizing the Voting Rights Act single-handedly. Um, and then I'll say, um, I think you're right, Burke, that, uh, you know, the, the, the public perception of Congress's dysfunction emboldens the president, although, you know, he's not far behind uh, in the public's uh, kind of disdain. Um, but all of that just seems dangerous to me um, because I just feel, again, who said goose for gander? I think it was Gillian. Um, you know, if, if, uh, if this president feels emboldened to kind of um, ride roughshod over congressional prerogatives because the public will tolerate it, um, we have to be prepared for president, pick, pick a name, Rand Paul, Marco Rubio, one of the other, it's gonna come back, right? Bush, Bush. yeah, no, we, absolutely. That's the, which, whichever Bush, <laughs> any particular Bush. So, yes. I just would say, Bert, I think as a result of the recent history since 9-11, uh, I really think that tendency has been very significantly tempered. I, mean, I, I understand you, maybe you disagree violently about that, but um, I really think you, you, you know, you've seen the president go to Congress to get authorizations for the use of military force, both in Iraq and, and with respect to the war in Afghanistan and generally the, the war on terror. You've seen... Congress address very significant national security issues by statute in the FISA Amendments Act, in the Military Commissions Act. You've seen the Supreme Court getting pulled in and deciding cases on some fundamental uh, national security issues and exercises of presidential authority and the involvement of the habeas corpus uh, statutes. And, and so you've got a series of very significant Supreme Court decisions in that area almost unprecedented. Uh, and so I think you really have seen, it's been very contentious and a lot of you know criticism and controversy between the branches and the, and the public policies have been debated, but I really think this is a period in history where you've seen the three branches actively engaged and the two political branches coming together in, in some in very important uh, examples of that. And so I think it does frame the landscape in which President Obama is addressing these, these issues too and kind of relitigating some of the, some of the contentions. But uh, I, I think there's an important element there that your question suggests uh, that uh, is, uh, was overlooking. Um, yeah. Joey, could you say a few more words about the Zivotofsky case? I'm sure most of the people in the room don't know anything about it. And it's really going to be a very important confrontation that's actually going to be decided by the court next year. That's sure. Um, uh, so uh, Zivotofsky is a case involving um, uh, a, a statute that 
um, authorizes uh, children who are born in, people who are born in Jerusalem to, ha to, to ask the State Department to list Jerusalem, Israel um, as their place of birth on their passport. This is at odds with um, established State Department um, policy uh, about, uh, uh, specific to Israel and also more generally about when there is an issue of contended, uh, contended uh, territorial claims over a, a particular place, how um, the state, the passport will be issued. Um, this is a case that has uh, a long, um, uh, a, a long past already in, in the courts. Um, first, there was an issue about standing. The district court said there was no standing. The DC Circuit um, found standing. Um, went back. The, the district court had also found no po political that it was a political question. Again, finds it to be a political question. DC Circuit agrees with that. Supreme Court takes it and says no political question, it's just an interpretation of a statute. And even though the issue of the scope of presidential power um, uh, over recognition, basically who gets to recognize um, uh, the, 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 you know, wh where Jerusalem is or, or the, the, the limits um, on how it will be acknowledged, um, whether that is for the president or whether that falls under congressional power, um, uh, in a variety of different sources that um, you, you could think of. Um, that question was very fully briefed um, and argued, um, and yet the Supreme Court sends it down to the D.C. Circuit to address. Um, and the D.C. Circuit issues a decision saying that the recognition power is exclusively the president's, striking this is an instance of the, the famous Jackson Zone 3. Um, very rare, we appear to have one. Um, and then the Supreme Court granted cert. Um, and so the question um, that is teed up is really whether or not uh, the statute requiring uh, the State Department on, a, on, on election to list Jerusalem, Israel, is an intrusion on the president's recognition power, um, constitutionally protected recognition power, um, or not. Um, uh, and if it's not, then the president's action refusing to list it is, is in violation of the statute. Um, and if it is, uh, then the statute itself uh, it would be uh, unconstitutional. Um, and that will be before the court next term. We can take one more, and I'm going to tell you that I'm going to give preference to a student uh, if a student has a question. Sorry, grown-ups. I, I mean, <laughs> wow, grown-ups grown was not the word I intended to use. Um, Sorry. My name is Sam Kleiner. I'm a student at Yale Law. Um, my question may be best directed towards Michael. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a bit about the, we've, we've heard a lot about the al Waki memo from OLC. Um, the Second Circuit opinion said we need to release it. It's been through much controversy, and now it looks like there, they will get a redacted release. Um, it seems like, strategically, it would be in the administration's interest to do that. Like, you, you had the North Washington speech, you had the National Defense University speech, but al Waki was a really bad guy, and it seems like actually the, the legal argument for the targeted killing is very clear, but the the inability to put forward that the fuller memo um, obfuscated that and allowed Rand Paul to make this crazy speech on the floor. Um, it, it, you know, it, is there anything more that can be done to, to allow OLC to, to put out these kind of memos? I know you want to have OLC. Please, please. I'm going to answer this question very carefully. Okay. Um, so anytime you're dealing with the release of a classified document uh, or a, a classif any, any classified document relating to a classified program. There are a number of agencies within the federal government that have a, an interest um, in that document. And so this is part of the intra-executive branch interplay that Jillian was talking about before. The decision is not just a decision about, for example, what um, one uh, one agency in the federal government thinks about a particular document. There is a process uh, that goes into the decision whether to release and declassify information. There are different stakeholders in that process because there are different agencies that have uh, data and information that gets input into particular memos uh, like that. And so the, the and so the decisions to release become very tricky and there is a there is an institutional bias that exists that uh, a lot of people have talked about. I think Jay Johnson has mentioned it in some of his speeches since he left the administration. But there is just an institutional bias to not release classified information because you don't want to be the person who made the mistake in releasing it. And, and so what we, what we have is, um, I, think, I think most people agree, we have sort of this reflexive, 
bias towards uh, not releasing information and releases uh, on sensitive documents tend to either be through leaks or when required by court or when there is a decision very high up in the administration um, to try to get ahead of what they see as inevitable uh, court orders or leaks or problems coming down the road. So these are very, very difficult uh, questions for an administration to deal with. I know that, that, uh, that, that you may have some views yeah, on this as well. I do. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I actually think the, the administration did took the right course here and uh, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, they released a pretty detailed summary of the legal analysis publicly earlier. Not the opinion itself because of the classified uh, information issue, but also because it's deliberative. They viewed it, I guess a court disagreed, but they viewed it as a deliberative advice memo, which needs to be protected because you want to encourage those who are giving candid, uh, giving advice to be candid and to really look at both sides of the issue and recognize the weaknesses as well as the strengths, et cetera. Um, but they did release a, uh, a detailed uh, analysis of the laws they sought that, under, that would underlie the decision. And I gather from the statements that what Senator Paul didn't like about the actual memo, he wouldn't like about the summary analysis either, and that is the lack of what he viewed as precedents from courts, which is not terribly surprising that this kind of issue would not have come before a court frequently, if ever. <laughs> Um, so it really was what was not in it that, that he was criticizing. But I think the, the classified information is likely to reflect sources, sources of information about a particular individual, and that's very sensitive, uh, very sensitive information. So I don't think that will ever actually see the light of day, or at least not, uh, not as a result of the court's order. That'll be redacted, that, that, that form of stuff. So, so I want to... Um Apologize to anyone who didn't get their questions asked. I want to apologize for implying anyone in the room was less than a grown-up. I want to <laughs> thank uh, Steve Bradbury, Michael Gottlieb, Jillian Metzger, and Ron Weich. Um,